Jennifer Smith graduated from Colgate in 2003 and has attended this conference as an intern, a participant, a panelist, a teacher, and an author. She started her publishing career at ICM and then jumped ship to the editorial side, where she's a senior editor at Ballantine, an imprint of Random House. This year alone, I've had the pleasure of selling her three projects. Jen has written four children's books, four children's books, and just started her fifth this morning. <laughs> I'm the first to read the pages. <laughs> if you have young kids, they've probably read her first two, book, two books, The Comeback Season and Wish You Were Here. Her third book, being published next January by Little Brown, is entitled The Statistical Probability of Love at First Sight. It's already been sold in 21 countries and optioned for film. <laughs> This middle grade, middle grade novel, The Storm Makers, is coming out in April, next April and is sure to follow suit. Jen is taking the young adult world by storm, pun intended. It's my <laughs> great pleasure to introduce Jennifer E. Smith. Uh, thanks so much, Andy. And thanks to everybody, and thanks to Matt especially. This is always such a wonderful year. And I think this might be my ninth or tenth year here. Um, so it's it's great to be here, as always. Um, I'm going to read from the the book that's coming out in January, The Statistical Probability of Love at First Sight. Um, and it's actually sort of significant to the conference in that I, two years ago when I was here, I, I started writing it. And last year when I was here was the first time I ever read from it. So um, it's nice to be here reading it when it's actually in book form, uh, or galley form. Um, I, um, because I read the first chapter last time, I'm just going to start from somewhere in the middle. There's not a whole lot of setup, except I guess to say that the basic plot of the book is it's about a teenage girl and teenage boy who meet on a flight from New York to London, and the book takes place over the course of 24 hours. The girl, Hadley, is on her way to her father's wedding to a woman that she's never met before, and she misses her flight by four minutes, and uh, um, ends up sitting next to a boy named Oliver on the next flight, and um, and so she's running late because she's on the wrong flight, which is, I guess, really all you need to know. Um, so I'm just sort of picking up in the middle of the chapter because I didn't want to read the entire chapter. <laughs> it was um, the man in front of them pushes open his plastic window shade, and a column of whiteness so startlingly bright that Hadley brings a hand to her eyes streams in all around them, snuffing out the darkness and stripping away whatever was left of last night's magic. Hadley reaches over to nudge open her own window shade, the spell now officially broken. Outside, the sky is a blinding blue, striped with clouds like layers on a cake. After so many hours in the dark, it almost hurts to look for too long. It's only 4 a.m. in New York, and when the pilot's voice comes over the PA, it sounds far too cheerful for the early hour. Well, folks, he says, we're making our final descent into Heathrow. The weather looks good down in London, 22 degrees and partly sunny. Hadley turns to Oliver. What's that in Fahrenheit? Warm, he says, and in that moment she feels too warm herself. Perhaps it's the forecast or the sun beating at the window, or maybe just the proximity of the boy at her side, his shirt wrinkled and his cheeks a ruddy pink. She stretches to reach the nozzle on the panel above her, twisting it all the way to the left and then closing her eyes against the thin jet of cool air. So, he says, cracking his knuckles one at a time. So. They look at each other sideways, and something about the expression on his face, an uncertainty that mirrors her own, makes Hadley want to cry. There's no real distinction between last night and this morning, of course, just dark bleeding into light, but even so, everything feels horribly different. She thinks of the way they stood together last night, how it seemed like they'd been on the brink of something, like the whole world was changing as they huddled together in the dark. And now here they are, like two polite strangers, like she'd only ever imagined the rest of it. She wishes they could turn around and fly back in the other direction, circling the globe backward, chasing the night they left behind. Do you think, she says, the words emerging thickly, that we might have used up all our conversation last night? Not possible, Oliver says, and the way he says it, his mouth turned up in a smile, his voice full of warmth, unwinds the knot in Hadley's stomach. We haven't even gotten to the really important stuff yet. Like what, she asks, trying to arrange her face in a way that disguises the relief she feels. Like what's so great about Dickens? Not at all, he says, more like the plight of the koalas, or the fact that Venice is sinking. He pauses, waiting for this to register, and when Hadley says nothing, he slaps his knee for emphasis. Sinking. The whole city. Can you believe it? She frowns in mock seriousness. That does sound pretty important. It is, Oliver insists, and don't even get me started on the size of our carbon footprint after this trip. 
or the difference between crocodiles and alligators, or the longest recorded flight of a chicken. <laughs> Please tell me you don't actually know that. 13 seconds, he says, leaning forward to look past her and out the window. This is a total disaster. We're nearly to Heathrow and we haven't even properly discussed flying chickens. <laughs> he sits back again. There's, see, there's loads to talk about still. We've only just gotten started. Even so, their eyes drift to the window to chart their progress, and Hadley pushes down a wave of panic, not so much for the landing itself, but for all that begins and ends with it. Out the window, the ground is rushing up to meet them, making everything, all the blurry shapes below, suddenly clear. The churches and the fences and the fast food restaurants, even the scattered sheep in an isolated field. And she watches it all draw closer, wrapping a hand tightly around her seatbelt, bracing herself as if arriving were no better than crashing. The wheels hit the ground, with one bounce, then two, before the velocity of the landing pins them firmly to the runway, and they're shot forward like a blown cork, all wind and engines and rushing noise, and a sense of momentum so strong that Hadley wonders if they'll be able to stop at all. But they do, of course they do, and everything goes quiet again. <laughs> After traveling nearly 500 miles an hour for almost seven hours, they now commence crawling to the gate with all the unhurried speed of an apple cart. Their runway fans out to join others like a giant maze until they're all swallowed by an apron of asphalt stretching as far as Hadley can see, interrupted only by radio towers and rows of planes and the great hulking terminal, which sits bleakly beneath the low gray sky. So this is London, she thinks. Her back is still to Oliver, but she finds herself glued to the window by some invisible force, unable to turn and face him without quite knowing why. As they pull up to the gate, she can see the ramp stretched out to meet them, and the plane slips into position gracefully. But even once they're firmly anchored in place, once the engines are cut and the seatbelt lights go off with a ping, Hadley remains still. There's a collective hum of noise at her back as the rest of the passengers stand to get their baggage, and Oliver waits a moment before lightly touching her arm. She whirls around. Ready, he asks, and she shakes her head, just barely, but enough to make him smile. Me neither, he admits, standing up anyway. As they make their way off the plane and up the walkway, neither of them says a word, but Hadley feels it anyway, bearing down on them like a freight train, the moment when they'll have to say goodbye. And for the first time in hours, she feels suddenly shy. Beside her, Oliver is craning his neck to read the signs for customs, already thinking about the next thing, already moving on. Because that's what you do on planes. You share an armrest with someone for a few hours. You exchange stories about your life, an amusing anecdote or two, maybe even a joke. You comment on the weather and remark about the terrible food. You listen to them snore, and then you say goodbye. So why does she feel so completely unprepared for this next part? She should be worrying about finding a taxi and making it to the church on time, seeing her dad again and meeting Charlotte. But what she's thinking about instead is Oliver, and this realization, this reluctance to let go, throws everything into sudden doubt. What if she's gotten it all wrong these last hours? What if it isn't as she thought? Already, everything is different. Already Oliver feels a million miles away. When they reach the end of the corridor, they're greeted by the tail end of a long queue, where their fellow passengers stand with bags strewn at their feet, restless and grumbling. As she drops her backpack, Hadley does a mental tally of all that she packed inside, trying to remember whether she threw in a pen that could be used to capture a phone number or an email address, some scrap of information about him, an insurance policy against forgetting. But she feels frozen inside of herself, trapped by her inability to say anything that won't come out sounding vaguely desperate. Oliver yawns and stretches, his hands high and his back arced, then drops his elbow casually onto her shoulder, pretending to use her for support. The weight of his arm feels like it might just be the thing to unbalance her, and she swallows hard before looking up at him, uncharacteristically flustered. Are you taking a cab, she asks, and he shakes his head and reclaims his arm. Tube, he says, it's not far from the station. Hadley wonders whether he's talking about the church or his house, whether he's heading home to shower and change or going straight there. She hates the fact that she won't know. It feels like the last day of school, the final night at summer camp, like everything is coming to an abrupt and dizzying end. When they reach the point where the line forks, they're greeted by a joyless customs official in a blue suit who's leaning against the metal railing and pointing to a sign that indicates which direction they're meant to go. EU citizens to the right, all others to the left, he repeats over and over again, his voice thin and reedy and mostly lost to the throng of the crowd. Hadley and Oliver exchange a look and all her uncertainty disappears. Because it's there in his face, a fleeting reluctance that matches her own. They stand there together for a long time, for too long, for what seems like forever, each unwilling to part ways, letting the people behind them stream around them like a river around rocks. Sir, the customs official says, breaking off mid-mantra to put a hand on Oliver's back. 
I'm going to have to ask you to keep moving so you don't hold up the line. Just a minute, Oliver begins, but he's cut off. Sir, now, the customs official says, directing him a little bit more insistently. A woman with a hiccuping baby is trying to push past Hadley, shoving her forward in the process, and there seems to be nothing to do but let herself be borne along by the current. But before she can move any farther, she feels a hand on her elbow, and just like that, Oliver is beside her again. He looks down at her with his head tilted, his hand still firmly on her arm, and before she has a chance to be nervous, before she even fully realizes what's happening, he bends to kiss her. The line continues to move around them, and the customs official gives up for the moment with a frustrated sigh, but Hadley doesn't notice any of it. She closes her eyes just for a moment, and the rest of the world disappears. By the time he pulls away with a grin, she's too stunned to say anything. She stumbles backwards step as the customs guy hurries Oliver along in the other direction, rolling his eyes. It's not like the lines lead to separate countries, he mutters. <laughs> <laughs> the concrete partition between the two areas is coming up fast between them, and Oliver lifts a hand to wave, still beaming at her. In a moment, Hadley realizes she won't be able to see him at all, but she catches his eye and waves back. He points a finger toward the front of his line, and she nods, hoping it means she'll see him out there. But then he's gone, and there's nothing to do but keep moving, her passport in hand, the feel of the kiss still lingering. But it's not long before she realizes that Oliver's wish has failed to come true. Her line is practically at a standstill, and sandwiched between a crying baby and a huge man in a Texas shirt, Hadley's never felt so impatient in her life. Her eyes dart from her watch to the wall behind which Oliver had disappeared, and she counts out the minutes with a feverish intensity, squirming and fidgeting, pacing and sighing as she waits. When it's finally her turn, she practically runs up to the glass window. Business or pleasure, the woman asks, as she studies her passport, and Hadley hesitates before answering, since neither answer seems quite accurate. <laughs> she settles on pleasure, though watching her father get married again could hardly be categorized that way, <laughs> then fires off answers to the rest of the questions with enough gusto to make the woman eye her a moment before stamping one of the many blank pages in Hadley's passport. Her suitcase rocks back and forth unsteadily as she hurries past the checkpoint toward the baggage claim. It's now 10.42, and if she doesn't manage to get a cab in the next few minutes, there's pretty much no chance she'll make the ceremony. But she's not thinking about that yet. She's thinking only of Oliver. And when she emerges into the baggage area, a sea of people all crowded behind a black rope, holding signs and waiting for friends and family, her heart sinks. The room is enormous, with dozens of carousels bearing brightly colored suitcases. And all around them, fanned out in every direction, are hundreds upon hundreds of people, each of them searching for something, for people or rides or directions, for things lost and found. Hadley wheels in a circle, her bags feeling like they weigh a thousand pounds, her shirt sticking to her back, her hair falling across her face. There are children and grandparents, limo drivers and airport officials, a guy with a Starbucks apron and three monks in red robes. A million people, it seems, and none of them Oliver. She backs up against the wall and sets down her things, forgetting even to worry about the crush of people. Her mind is too busy with the possibilities. It could have been anything, really. His line could have taken longer. He could have been held up at customs. He might have emerged earlier and assumed that she'd gone ahead. They could have crossed paths and not even noticed. He might simply have left. But still, she waits. The giant clock above the flight board stares down at her accusingly, and Hadley tries to ignore the mounting sense of panic that's ballooning inside her. How could he not have said goodbye? Or was that what he meant by the kiss? Still, after all those hours, all those moments between them, how could that just be it? She realizes she doesn't even know his last name. The very last place she wants to be right now is a wedding. She can almost feel the last of her energy receding like water spiraling down a drain. But as the minutes tick by, it's becoming harder to ignore the fact that she's going to miss the ceremony. And so, with some amount of effort, she peels herself away from the wall to make one last sweep of the place, her feet heavy as she paces the enormous terminal. But Oliver, with his blue shirt and untidy hair, is nowhere to be found. All right. I, uh, <laughs> the intro actually doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with Ellery, but I figured, <laughs> I figured it was, uh, Matt, Matt thought it would be, yeah. <laughs> and, and Matt will take her if she wants. I first met uh, Jennifer um, here in 2008 at the conference. Uh, she came for a reading. And then in uh, September of that year, um, I read Easter Island, her first book. And I remember it's uh, Easter Island's about Easter Island's about a botanist named Greer Faraday, 
And, uh, I mean, uh, and, and, and an older story about a woman named Elsa Pendleton that takes place on Easter Island. It's a complicated story. I remember thinking how ambitious it was when I read it for a first novel. And about uh, four-fifths of the way into it, um, Jennifer accomplishes a uh, Jamesian sort of double gainer with a half twist. <laughs> Dive into the swimming pool. I'll stand her back. Oh, did she lose her pacifier? Uh, well, now you've seen the, now you've seen the, the cute part. In, the in any case, Jennifer does this amazing thing about three quarters of the way through the book, or four four fifths of the way through the book. Um, a, sort of a Jamesian, unreliable narrator, a central event of massive import that remains stubbornly ambiguous, um, and a sort of a retrospective, subtle reinterpretation of a lot of the stuff that has gone before. And I remember thinking, you know, I wouldn't have thought of even trying something like this in my first novel, let alone accomplishing it. And um, then, out of curiosity, when I was done with the book, I uh, looked online to see like reviews and readers' comments and stuff. And I found that she had suffered the usual punishment of doing something that, that subtle and ambitious, which was that um, almost everyone that I read, including the critics, seemed to have um, misinterpreted um, uh, I thought what was going on. So I emailed Jennifer, just kind of saying, Am I, am I crazy? Isn't there something like much more interesting and ambiguous going on here? And are all these critics like misreading this? And and she wrote back and said, uh, in fact, uh, there was supposed to be something a lot more complicated and ambiguous. And so that sort of just started an email correspondence between us, uh, which we kept on, um, you know, ever since then. And then occasional visits to New York, and of course, once Ellery showed up, you know, I went down to visit her to. To see, to see the baby. But uh, so that's how sort of we became friends, is sort of bonding over how even positive reviews can be awfully irritating. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just very quickly give her uh, a biography. Um, she's an American novelist and essayist. <laughs> <laughs> she graduated. <laughs> with an MFA from the Iowa Writers' Workshop in 2000, and Easter Island, the book that uh, we uh, bonded over, is her first novel published in 2003. It's translated into 16 languages. Not 21. That's right, close to 21. It was named one of the best books of the year by the Washington Post and the Christian Science Monitor. In 2005, she was a Guggenheim Fellow. In 2010, she published her second novel, Strangers at the Feast, which takes place, I think she's going to be reading from today, takes place in one day, Thanksgiving Day, Connecticut family coming together on Thanksgiving Day, um, uh, in which her transitions are accomplished <laughs> seamlessly, artfully, <laughs> and, and unobtrusively. Um, the paperback's coming out in August of this year, um, and she's currently working on a novel set during World War II, which I have seen part of and am very excited to see the rest of, and that should be out, one hopes, in late 2012 or early 2013. Um, her nonfiction has appeared in the New York Times and the Washington Post, and very soon, <laughs> tomorrow, maybe, in the uh, Wall Street Journal. So please join me in welcoming Jennifer Vanderbilt. This reading is going to be a huge buzzkill after Jennifer, <laughs> so I'm just letting you know that now. Also, 24-hour novel, airport, even in the section I'm reading, but nothing, nothing as delightful as what Jennifer read. Um, just a quick thank you to Matt Leone for having me back here, um, for my really passionate and wonderful workshop students um, who've made this week totally delightful. Um, you guys are really smart and great to, great to meet with every morning. Um, and also thanks for everybody who's been lending a hand with my childcare. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm reading from Strangers at the Feast, um, and actually this chapter, uh, 
unfortunately does not um, uh, illustrate any of the graceful transitions. <laughs> um, it's a, it, it is entirely a flashback chapter um, to the sort of patriarch of the family, Gavin. Um, just a, the novel is all set entirely on Thanksgiving Day, and um, each chapter uh, is, is um, in a different character's point of view. And you become aware through the course of uh, the day that there is um, uh, a crime being committed. Uh, and you're also in the point of view of the um, sort of criminals in the novel and uh, the sort of uh, one of the mysteries of the story is sort of how those um, two, two narrators will actually intersect. <clears throat> but this is Gavin's uh, story, and he is, um, as you get early in the novel from the perspective of his children, a uh, somewhat um, elusive, mysterious father. Uh, his own wife uh, doesn't, in, you know, doesn't feel like she entirely understands him after many years. And uh, he's the sort of last family member whose mind you get inside. And that was very important to me in writing the story, that you sort of get everybody else's take on him. And he sort of, you know, he, he arrives late, he sort of quietly sits in the corner of the room. So this is sort of the moment when the reader starts to understand what the world looks like for Gavin. <clears throat> Gavin's father, Albrecht Olson, came to the United States at 17 and worked as a fishmonger. From a cart along Boston Harbor, he sold shellfish, cod, flounder, and striped porky. His palms were like leather from handling the cracked shells of clams and scallops. His fingers blistered from packing the fish in ice. Decades after he stopped working the port, his wife claimed his hands still smelled of fish oil. He vowed he would never leave the sea until he took to the air. During World War II, for three years, he flew P-47 Thunderbolts over France and Germany. Albrecht received a Medal of Honor and had his photo taken with Dwight D. Eisenhower. For the rest of his life, the photo hung framed on the wall of his office. During the war, he met Christina Davenport, who, against the wishes of her well-to-do Boston family, served as a nurse in the Italian rear hospital where Ulrich had been laid up with a neck injury. When the war ended, they married and returned to the town of Winthrop. With the GI Bill, Ulrich attended the University of Massachusetts, finally giving up fishmongering to become an accountant. Gavin was their only child. We got everything in our first try, his mother said, though he later suspected she had wanted more but had been unable to conceive again. Things came easily to him. Blue ribbons in science fairs, first chair and violin. By sophomore year of high school, he was captain of the track team and class president. He graduated Winthrop High as valedictorian and won a full scholarship to Yale. Most important, Winthrop was a small town, and he was Ulrich Olson's only son, which meant he was beloved. The town had lost 111 sons and brothers in the war, and Ulrich had not only survived but returned with a medal. People sought Ulrich's advice on investments and wills, on building additions to their homes, on whether to vote for Kennedy or Nixon. He had even saved the marriage of the town tax collector after talking with the couple for 16 straight hours in their kitchen. He accompanied Marjorie Plymouth, the town librarian, to visit her estranged father in prison, where he was serving 10 years for grand larceny. In 1954, when Hurricane Carol came north, Ulrich went ha house to house helping people board up their windows. That same year, he was elected mayor. Gavin's father was also a licensed justice of the peace and officiated at 37 marriages. He was godfather to six children, one named Ulrich, another Oslo. He taught Gavin to fell a tree, to make snowshoes from twigs and bark, to catch and debone a fish, to skin a deer, to clean a gun. He was a volunteer fighter fighter, and in 1969, while Gavin was thousands of miles away filling out supply forms on a Smith Corona in a stuffy Saigon office, his father at age 50 died pulling Abigail Kentworth, Gavin's eighth grade teacher, from the second floor of her burning house. It was Ulrich who had first wanted Gavin to fight in the war. Before the political problems were clear, when Gavin was home from college, they would watch the news on their small television. First the Nazis, now the communists, his father said in his thick Norwegian accent. Good men have to clean up these messes. So after graduation, while his classmates were driving over packed station wagons to Canada, or posting applications to medical and law schools, veterinary college, any institution that would keep the draft board at bay, Gavin walked into the Naval Air Program recruiter's office and asked to be a fighter pilot. But because of his vision, they wouldn't take him. The Army, however, had different standards. Eleanor, whom he'd been dating for six months, was crestfallen. What if something happens to you? Why do you have to go? This was 1968. As Gavin later told himself many times, the draft board would have gotten its hands on him soon enough. 
Eleanor Haggerty was the daughter of a French Protestant mother and a lapsed Catholic Irish-American father. She wore short skirts and had a waist Gavin could practically put his hand around. He called her his little Huguenot. He met her the summer before her junior year at Wellesley. He had just graduated from Yale, and for one long June weekend, they were both on Cape Cod. He had noticed her sunning herself on a small raft, dipping her hand in the water every so often to moisten her slender arms. She seemed at first to be of the group of friends, but she'd floated off on her own, and when she realized how far out she was, slipped off her raft and began swimming somewhat urgently toward the shore. Finally wrestling her, wrestling her raft to the sand, she stood dripping before him, shaking water from her ears. She had a swan-like neck, a delicate and pointed chin, flirtatious lips. That was some situation out there, Gavin said. She thumbed her red gingham swimsuit off her thigh and something plopped onto the sand. Ick! Jellyfish. <laughs> Can't blame them for wanting to get close to you, he said. <laughs> well, look at you, standing there all amused. What would you have done if I were drowning? Give you the kiss of life. <laughs> Don't you wish, Mr. Shy. <laughs> she was a girl who turned heads, and she knew it. Her mother, Yvette, kept her on a tight leash. Gavin couldn't take Eleanor out for dinner without first having a glass of apple juice in, <clears throat> sorry, in Yvette's living room and discussing the works of Tolstoy or Sigmund Freud. Yvette hadn't gone to college, but she loved talking to big men about big ideas. And you, mister, she always said to Gavin, are going places. <clears throat> Yvette had met Eleanor's father at age 16 when he helped liberate her small village of Gravelotte. She'd been in the United States long enough to shed her accent and all evidence of her Frenchness. Yvette, which she pronounced Yvette, sorry, um, was more American than Bessie Ross. On the 4th of July, she cooked them a five-course meal, pinned small flags on their lapels, and set off her own backyard fireworks. <laughs> the Irish-American father was long dead by then, and not much spoken of. When Gavin asked what he died of, Eleanor looked off and said, liver trouble. There had been a sister, too, Simone, a year younger than Eleanor. She had died of polio. Yvette and Eleanor never spoke of her, except once a year on August 5th, when they quietly celebrated her birthday. As an adult, long after her mother had died, on that date, Eleanor would sit alone in the kitchen at night and blow out three candles on a cupcake. Yvette was an anxious mother. She wanted to know exactly where Gavin and Eleanor were going and when they'd be back, that they would wear seat belts and stay below the speed limit, that they'd avoid Boston's bad neighborhoods, that they wouldn't fool around with marijuana. Gavin thought it stemmed from the pain of losing her other daughter or her childhood under Nazi occupation. Eleanor shrugged off her mother's worries, inventing elaborate stories about puppet shows and choral groups they'd seen to cover for the hours they spent making out in Gavin's red Chevrolet. A month before Gavin shipped off, Eleanor took the bus to Fort Benning to see him. Yvette came as well, nervous about Eleanor traveling, but kept herself tucked away in the farewell motel. <coughs> Eleanor wore a red seersucker dress and yellow high heels and looked so pretty Gavin felt as if he were seeing her for the first time. She'd brought scissors and cut off a lock of her hair and tied it with a ribbon. Keep this in your pocket all the time, over your heart, and keep these under your pillow. From her purse, she removed a pair of panties, pale pink with small white flowers and lace trim. She twirled them around with her fingertip, giggling, a, brush, a blush creeping across her face before flinging them at his face. You're killing me, Ellie. Promise me, no matter how long they keep you there, you're mine. How about I promise in front of a judge? His father, his training captain, they both advised him to get hitched. The war could be long and a wife might be the only sure thing to come home to. Two days after they married, as Gavin stepped onto the transport plane, he had the deep sense that he was about to prove himself, to define his character in some fundamental way. He imagined becoming a man like his father. Though later he would never admit this to anyone, he was filled with grand visions of heroics, scenarios in which he rescued scores of wounded men, men who, unlike himself, had been careless enough to get shot. But during Gavin's third week in the infantry, while leading a jungle patrol, a piece of shrapnel pierced his knee. And that was that, a three millimeter sliver of metal, which he would save and occasionally look at his entire life, ended his frontline duty. He spent his final 18 months of duty as an REMF, a rear echelon motherfucker. <laughs> College grads were pressed to work as typists, and Gavin became a clerk in the administrative company of the 101st Airborne Division. He spent long, hot days writing reports on promotions and demotions, filling out supply requisitions, typing up weather forecasts. He once wrote a report on the plant and insect life of the Ban, Ban Meteot region and spoke to a medical research team about insect-borne illnesses. 
In 18 months, those were his most exciting five days. In the evenings before dinner, he drafted a letter to his father. Although the war was looking bloodier and more misguided every day, Gavin feared his desk job would disappoint his father. Gavin had written four drafts, but had sent none when he learned of his father's death. In 1971, he got his discharge. A couple of dozen men flew in a military, military transport plane to Travis Air Force Base, cheering raucously when they landed. They strolled from the plane to the terminal, gulping down the evening air, laughing and bumping shoulders. To get a half-price standby spot on a commercial airline, they had to arrive in uniform. At the San Francisco airport, the gate attendant told Gavin it would be another hour before she knew if he had a seat to Boston. He hadn't been in an American bar, hadn't sat on one of those vinyl bar stools in two years. He was in heaven. He scooped a fistful of salted peanuts into his mouth and ordered a Budweiser. Down the bar stood a girl with blonde hair. A rainbow ribbon fastened a ponytail on each of her shoulders. She looked barely old enough to be drinking. She wore bell-bottom jeans and noisy platform clogs, taking short, heavy steps as if in leg chains as she came toward him with her drink. A black beauty mark underscored one eye, and her teeth were perfectly straight and white, the kind of teeth the girls in Vietnam dreamed of. She propped her hand on her hip in that same sassy way Eleanor always did before telling him he'd done something wrong. Sorry, I didn't mean to stare, he said, but you don't know how good you look right now. Really? She leaned close, her ponytails brushing his pants, and whispered, And how good did all those babies look before you killed them? Gavin felt the icy liquid on his chest before he saw her empty, empty glass. A fucking monster. He looked around, and through the blur of wet shame, he saw the bartender, two stewardesses sharing a martini, a family with small children. They were all staring. Gavin fumbled for his wallet, laid a wad of bills on the bar, and left. Slowly, dizzily, he made his way to the men's room, where he locked himself in a stall until it was time to board the plane. In Boston, Eleanor met him at the airport. Gavin said nothing of what had happened. Eleanor had had a difficult couple of years caring for her mother, who had been diagnosed with cancer. They sent letters during his time away, in which she described her literature classes, her professors, and Gavin complained about the food, the weather, or the broken fan in his office. Neither said what was really on their minds, because as soon as Gavin shipped 7,000 miles away, it seemed to have dawned on them both that they didn't know each other very well. As Yvette was slowly dying, Eleanor was becoming more and more like her mother. She was nervous about where they would live, what job he would find, and how they would afford furniture. She was nervous about his mood, which was not, as a matter of course in those days, very good. His father was dead, the Kent State Massacre had just <laughs> happened, and war memorials were being doused with tar and urine. In Winthrop, where for years he'd been treated like a prince, people said, It's such a shame you signed on for that mess. After Eleanor's mother died, they moved to New York City. Gavin thought it might be easier living in a place where everyone didn't know that for two years he'd been burning villages. Everyone didn't think that for two years he'd been burning villages. Focused on making good money for a few years to alleviate Eleanor's fears, Gavin interviewed for jobs at Morgan Stanley, Fidelity, Goldman Sachs. But there was no way to hide his war, rec his war record. The three-year gap on his resume and his slight limp said it all. After all the gruesome news reports, his interviewers, who had probably once been as enthusiastic about the war as he had been, seemed uneasy with the idea of a veteran down the corridor. Morgan Stanley and Fidelity claimed they didn't have openings. The hiring manager at Goldman Sachs wanted to know if he was undergoing psychiatric treatment. I graduated from Yale with straight A's in economics. I have a recommendation from Franklin Summerworth. What more do you want? Mr. Olson, try not to let yourself get worked up. He offered Gavin water, a sugar cookie, no job. Gavin interviewed for two months before he got an offer. I think you'll take to the calm environment here, the man at Reynolds Insurance said. Gavin was given a small windowless office on the 29th floor of the Empire State Building. The walls were blue and hung with framed photographs of roses and irises, powder room decor. Classical music was pumped through a small speaker mounted in the corner. He sold life, fire, car, medical, flood, and umbrella policies. Over the phone, he convinced people they could lose everything in the blink of an eye, which he was beginning to believe. There were 10 other office doors with other nameplates, and occasionally he heard the soft click of doors opening and closing. But they all kept different hours and submitted their weekly sales sheets to a large oak box marked Progress. Notes would appear on his desk afterward. Good work, Jay Reynolds. It wasn't until their first quarterly strategy meeting that Gavin looked around the elliptical glass conference table at a dozen men his age, one with a stump of an arm, another in a wheelchair. 
Jeremiah Reynolds' only son had been killed flying a Huey over Tain Inn. Eleanor was trying to make a life in New York, but Gavin hated building mixers, but Gavin hated, hated the building mixer she arranged. He couldn't bear standing around with law students and hippies, self-righteous draft dodgers who wouldn't have lasted a day in any army. You mustn't be so judgmental, Eleanor would complain. They judge me. Insurance salesman equals idiot. And they're right, it's a dead end job. If I told them I was a vet, then maybe they'd see what I was up against. But that's a conversation stopper. Sweetheart, please don't go about advertising it. It makes people uncomfortable. And this was the beginning of Gavin's realization that for the rest of his life, most people, no matter what he said about his Saigon desk job, would still imagine he'd gone on a killing spree in the jungle. Two million men served in the war, only a fraction in ground combat. The truth was, Gavin had killed two men before his injury. He shot them close enough to see their faces, which he thought of from time to time, and which disturbed him. He wished he'd known their names. It seemed a shameful act to kill a man and not know his name. But none of his feelings resembled those of the disturbed veteran characters who eventually appeared in movies. It seemed to him that, people, that the people who had stayed home wanted veterans to be tortured, wanted soldiers to be paying penance for the whole misguided endeavor, because as long as the men who fought were still dealing with it, everyone else could sweep the war under the rug. Gavin didn't want veterans neglected. A few Reynolds men kept flasks in their desks, and all day he heard the glide of drawer casters, the loud sigh after a sip of gin. But when the world so firmly expected a person to unravel, it felt like someone tugging the thread. After six months at Reynolds, Gavin wanted to escape his windowless office. If no one would hire him, he'd go back to school. He'd get so many degrees, no firm could pass him over. He decided to apply to law school, studying for the LSATs while he was supposed to be making sales calls. His Reynolds colleagues advised against it. Campuses were hotbeds of anti-war sentiment. Hippies were shouting veterans out of classrooms. Gavin also knew that money would be tricky, and he and Eleanor would have to move. But he didn't want to get stuck in sales his whole life, and told Eleanor as much. Sweetheart, you can't go back to school. You're going to be a father. Gavin was stunned. In all the scenarios of his future, parenthood had not entered his mind, and it was the one thing that changed everything. In the years after the children were born and they moved to Westport, as Gavin rode the long commuter train home at night with a folder of actuari actuarial reports in his lap, he thought back to high school in Winthrop, where he'd been voted most likely to succeed, to his years at Yale, where he'd once dined with the university president, where, after he took the 800-meter title from Princeton, his teammates carried him over their heads through campus chanting, Olson, Olson. Sometimes when this memory seized him, Gavin would nearly leap from his train seat and press his palms to the black windows of the doors. He lowered his body in a lunge, one leg thrown back so that his calf muscle tingled in an almost exquisite pain, the seams of his wool suit pulled tight. Through the dark windows lay the towns where all the men seated around him would soon carry their briefcases down silent streets, wipe the bottoms of their polished shoes on, welcome, on a welcome mat, greet their aproned wives, kiss their children, and have a conversation about the weather, the grocery bill, new kitchen cabinets. Sometimes Gavin pushed so hard against the windows that the men around him glanced up from their newspapers. See, I'm not like you. But they looked down again quickly, bored and unconvinced, and Gavin eventually lifted his own briefcase in defeat and stood dutifully awaiting his release into the night. This sense of entrapment produced in Gavin a child's rebellion. In the early years, amid his long days at Reynolds Insurance, he indulged in juvenile deceptions, half-hearted dalliances, but only what he believed fell within the scope of masculine autonomy. Eleanor, who never shed the anxiety she'd inherited from her mother, raised the children, and one day, the small giggly creatures who had waved around macaroni artwork, who had stampeded through the house dressed as unicorns and dragons, were, he realized, kind-hearted human beings. Miraculously, his house was filled with what he recalled from his own childhood as love. Clumsy, unspoken, harried, nonetheless love. And toward his wife, he noticed a growing affection, the familiarity that came with decades of shared breakfasts, whispered post-party astonishment at the misbehavior of other people's children, amusement at drunken neighbors wielding garden hoses at midnight. But this affection was compromised, he believed, by Eleanor having borne witness to what had become of his life, by her memory of who he had been. And he recalled the woman he had imagined his wife would be, from time to time, these ghosts, these younger other selves, tiptoed down from the attic, 
rattled the windows while he slept. He felt deceived. He woke in the night and looked at Eleanor. Did she feel it as well? He did not know how to express tenderness to the person who had become the mirror of his disappointments, who had seen his every failure. Eleanor accepted their life, and him, with a cheer that rendered him silent. She suggested after-dinner strolls, picnics at the beach. With a stoniness he did not quite understand, Gavin refused her. The idea that he was punishing her made him sick. It was himself he loathed. And yet, in his obligations as a husband, he decided he was fulfilling his duty. He worked hard, paid the bills, he rarely drank, never raised his voice. He was an insurance man now, that was all. She should not expect more. If he had to accept life's disappointments, so would she.